What exactly do Americans think about philanthropy and nonprofit organizations? Hi, I'm Bill Stanjakevich. This is the first day from the fundraising school, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Chelsea Clark. Chelsea is a leader within the research team at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, in which resides the fundraising school. And as I've said often, our greatest advantage at the fundraising school is that wherever possible, our curriculum is research-based, including and especially from the research of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, where Dr. Clark provides such important wisdom and insight. Chelsea, thanks for coming back to the Fundraising Schools podcast. Oh, thank you for having me and for that very kind and generous introduction, Bill. And there's a new research study out, what Americans think about philanthropy and nonprofits. And so, Chelsea, what do Americans think? Well, that is a big question, and I will do my best to um, provide some insights. Um, Really, we started this project wondering what the typical American thought about philanthropy and nonprofits broadly. Um, And so to really begin our study, we had to ask the question, what does someone even think of when they hear the term philanthropy. So we wanted to start with definitions. We didn't wanna go in just assuming that the American public, the the everyday person on the street thinks about philanthropy and nonprofits the way that that we do or various fundraising professionals do. Um, And so we just asked some definitional questions to begin with. um, And we quickly learned um, that the typical things you might think of, charitable giving, volunteering, those items came up really at the top of the list for most people when we asked about philanthropy and what that meant. Um, Those were the two things they they easily thought about. Um, And then some other questions that we asked during the study after we sort of set the tone and and had these definitions is we wanted to know things like, do we trust nonprofits? Do we trust um, philanthropists? Do we think that nonprofits are transparent? Um, Do we think that they are going to be confident to solve the issues that we're seeing today? Um, And we looked at the nonprofit sector compared to the other sectors of society like business and government. Um, But then we also looked within the nonprofit sector um, at various types of nonprofit entities like religious organizations um, compared to secular charities. We looked at um, community foundations and private foundations and a lot of different types of um, philanthropic entities. Um, And, you know, very, um, you know, positively, we saw that by and large Americans um, trust nonprofits see them as more transparent when compared to other entities like various branches of government um, or the business sector. Um, But we didn't necessarily see off the charts level of trust or transparency. So so they're trusted more than other entities, um, but really none of the sectors of society are are trusted completely or fully. Um, So, you know, there's work to be done in terms of how trustworthy or transparent we see the philanthropic sector. And And one of these... I was going to say one of these other lines of conversation involve, you know, the size of gifts. Are we seeing predominantly giving from just wealthier individuals? Are we also seeing those small gifts? We know what our data show, but what do American people think? Sure. We um, wanted to get at this question from really two different perspectives because we did want to know what people thought about the the size of the gift. You know, did it matter whether it was small gifts from everyday donors or large gifts from from big donors? Um, And so we kind of segmented our survey. And so we asked um, two separate questions in this area. Um, And so for a portion of the survey respondents, we we sort of asked them to do a head to head comparison um, and ask them, you know, which is more important? The, the big gifts from you know a few donors or a lot of small gifts from everyday donors. Um, and then another portion of the sample, we asked the questions sequentially um, and, and didn't ask, you know, which is more important. We just asked how important are both of these types of giving. And you know what we learned was that by and large, the American public thinks that both types of giving matter. Um, they see both as important. When we are looking at them head to head and having to make a choice to say, are the bigger gifts more important or are the smaller gifts more important? We saw a slight edge where people thought that or they preferred, you know, a lot of small gifts from a lot of different donors. Um, when we asked them sequentially, we saw that both were very important, um, but there was a slight edge to those larger gifts. And, and we kind of were thinking it could be that people, while they really like the idea of many, many gifts from everyday donors, they're thinking that there might be a bigger impact from you know, the large gifts um, from large donors. But the take-home story really was that they saw that both types of giving were really valuable. 
Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that part of the study. You know, do you think the larger gifts are important? Do you think smaller gifts from a lot of people are important? And most people said, um, yeah. Pretty yes. much both. <laughs> they both matter. <laughs> yeah. Maybe and, in and, different ways. And that is so important for us to understand as leaders and fundraisers uh, in the nonprofit sector. Chelsea, what do we know about these respondents? You know, is, when you think about this question about, you know, big gifts, small gifts, People wonder, well, what was the uh, household income of the respondents? Or, you know, are we talking men? Are we talking women? We've known historically that religious observance can influence what people think about charitable giving in the nonprofit sure. sector. Does the study reveal anything in that regard in terms of maybe people from different backgrounds responding similarly or differently? Sure. So to, to begin with, to answer your question, this is a nationally representative sample of American adults. Um, so everyone is represented across the wealth income spectrums, male, female, different races, ethnicities. Um, so everyone is, is represented in this study. Um, we did look into some of the key findings. Um, and so some of the interesting things that we saw pop out when we were looking at some of the subgroups is we saw that women specifically and younger individuals had more of an ex maybe expansive way of looking at things like the question of what is philanthropy. So when we asked that question, um, you know, we saw charitable giving volunteering pop a lot, but um, women and younger people, donors and people with more education were more likely to cite some additional things that they thought of as, as philanthropy. Um, they included more um, answers to the question about what is charitable giving. So it just seemed that there was a bit of a more expanded view of what was included in being charitable or being generous for, for again, our, our, the women in our study, um, the younger individuals, um, sort of like for the next generation individuals in our study, millennials and, and, and Gen Z, um, and then also people who are donors compared to non-donors and people with more education. Um, when we asked people about whether or not um, they viewed themselves as a philanthropist. We also saw some differences here where um, it really didn't necessarily align with whether you gave to charity or you volunteered. We saw that younger people actually, while they weren't giving as frequently, chari like giving charitably, um, they actually were more likely to use the title of philanthropist and apply it to themselves, which was sort of interesting. Um, and then one thing uh, kind of to note on that topic, the term philanthropist isn't broadly used by those in our sample. So, you know, we saw that 60% of Americans are giving to charity, 30% said that they volunteered last year, but only about 20% actually claimed the title of philanthropist when they asked you, when we asked them if they self-identified as a philanthropist. So again, there's there's this disconnect between while we think of a philanthropist as someone who gives charitably, someone who volunteers, the respondents are sorry didn't necessarily put two and two together and say, well, I give charitably and I volunteer, therefore I'm a philanthropist. Um, they were more likely to name someone like Bill Gates. Um, mm -hmm. So again, going back to that, you know, big, small gift question. Um, but so there were some differences within the subgroups and, and those are some of the things that we saw that popped out. And, and that's a wonderful statistical reinforcement of one of our teachings in the fundraising school when uh, we teach our participants the word philanthropy and the word philanthropist might not apply broadly to the folks who you are mm -hmm. speaking with, that instead we might want to use words like generosity or donor or volunteer, somebody who helps, you know, these types of phrases might be more accessible and resonate with more people. And we can infer that uh, from the findings in this study. Uh, Chelsea, any differences by racial demographics? And also, historically, we know there's been this connection between religious observance uh, and, you know, philanthropic charitable behavior. Are there any learnings from this study in that regard? Um, well, actually, on that same question about who is a philanthropist, um, we did see that that African Americans were more likely to self-identify as a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting finding. Um, and then in terms of um, religious giving, um, there weren't a lot of things that popped in that area. Um, um, we do, we do, a lot of times see a correlation, obviously, between whether someone is religious and whether they're giving to religious entities. And we saw some correlations with how much they trusted. So when those questions on trust and transparency, um, people who were more religious were more likely to trust and see as transparent religious institutions. So some of the things that are not necessarily surprising, um, you know, the, that we or the things that we found in this study in that area. Yeah, wonderful um, findings and then building upon previous research. 
you know, Chelsea, one of the things that grabbed my attention most was this awareness or more accurately lack of awareness of the nonprofit sector. So, you know, sure. we talk about trust and there are other public opinion surveys and, um, you know, population studies out there that show that trust overall in American culture is declining across the board, across so many institutions and behaviors and organizations and such. But one of the findings is just the kind of utter lack of awareness of the nonprofit sector. Can you describe what the study found? Sure. You know, I think that is one of the reasons we wanted to do this study to begin with. Um, you know, it's very easy to when we're inside the sector, you know, to, to think that everyone else thinks exactly like we do, to assume that everyone knows what we have, that they have the same level of knowledge, that they understand, again, what philanthropy is, what a nonprofit is, what it does, what types of services it provides. Um, and, and we really wanted to ask these very broad questions to see, you know, there's a lot of debates going on um, within the sector about um, foundations and about donor advised funds and some rules and some policy implications. And we wanted to know if the general American understood these concepts and was, um, you know, had an opinion one way or another on some of these, these big debates that we're having within the field. Um, and, you know, what we really learned was that by and large, people are, are pretty positive towards the concept of a nonprofit, of philanthropy, of the philanthropic sector, but aren't very knowledgeable about any of the interworkings of how it all happens. Um, so again, you know, we started with definitions of what is philanthropy. We didn't necessarily ask people to define what a nonprofit is or what it does. But what we learned indirectly um, was that there doesn't seem to be a lot of awareness about what nonprofit services even are. So for instance, we asked a question about whether you or someone in your household had received services from a nonprofit within the past year. And we found pretty surprisingly that only about 5% of our sample Ha said that they had received some type of service from a nonprofit. Um, and, you know, for all the different ways that we engage with nonprofits day in and day out um, through things like religious services or educational program or, um, you know, going to a museum or a cultural event, um, you know, in addition to things like receiving basic needs, services, and there's so many ways that we interact with nonprofits every day. And I don't think these are the sorts of things that were coming to mind uh, because, it's pretty clear that, that more than 5% of Americans are engaging with nonprofits on a regular basis, but there's some sort of disconnect because when we asked them to flesh out that question, we, we heard things for the people who did say yes to that question. Yes, they'd receive services. It was really related to more of those basic needs type services. Um, that's what they were mentioning. And it seems like that's all that was coming to mind. So there's some level of education that it might be lacking or, or could really just be a way for, um, you know, fundraising professionals and nonprofits to, to step up and to really explain the types of services that they do provide, why those services are important to maybe remind people that they are receiving services from nonprofits, even when they might not realize it. Um, and therefore, you know, reinforce the fact of, of why charitable giving and why volunteering is so important. I just want to amplify that point before I ask Chelsea for any final advice that she has for fundraisers to be able to utilize this study. My next hypothesis would be that almost all Americans use the nonprofit sector every day. I know, you know, all and every are really dangerous words to use when conducting research, but we know that the nonprofit sector is so ubiquitous across our culture. If you go to the library, the library likely has a foundation that raises charitable support mm -hmm. to help you use that library. If you've gone to a medical facility, if you watch public television, listen to public radio, I mean, you just kind of go down the list of just everyday things, and it really shows a lack of awareness of who we are as a nonprofit uh, sector. And just to amplify what Chelsea said there, that as fundraisers, we can't take for granted that a widespread number of people even know what philanthropy or the nonprofit sector is, let alone about our particular nonprofit organization, about our particular cause, about how we are making a difference. And so we just encourage everybody, you might think this is obvious, this research study shows it's not obvious to a wide swath of people. So continue to just repeat those messages about your organization, what you do, why you do that, what your impact is. And, uh, you know, leaders, we have to repeat things over and over again. Leaders don't communicate. Leaders over communicate. And that includes when we're leading as fundraisers. Chelsea, what other takeaways, what advice do you have uh, in addition to that good wisdom you shared with us on how fundraisers can utilize this wonderful study? 
Sure. I think that's really one of the key takeaways. Um, but then if you pair that with the earlier conversation we were have about having about the big gifts and the small gifts, I think it's important to also remind and remind and remind again how important every single gift is. And not just to remind people that it's important, but if there's a way to make a connection between, yes, your gift matters, and here is the exact impact it's going to have Again, if we're thinking that people don't understand what the services are, if you can say, you know, these are the services we're providing, this is how your gift at this level is going to make an impact and allow us to continue providing X, Y, Z service. Um, I think there's just, you know, some light bulbs that are going to go off for people where they, they see those connections and they now say, oh, I didn't know that my small gift of X amount was actually going to add up and make the impact and provide that service that, oh, by the way, I didn't even know I was receiving that service, but I certainly want to continue receiving that service. So my gift really does matter. It does have an impact and I benefit from it or my community at large benefits from, from my gift and the gift of others. I would just echo that strongly to the extent that the data show that a lower percentage of households now donate somewhere in the range of 55%. To the extent that there's concern that charitable giving is predominant amongst donors making larger gifts, this is social science. This is human behavior. There's never one magic answer for anything associated with human behavior, including charitable giving. There could be many reasons for those data associated with charitable giving. Let's not let one of those reasons be because fundraisers aren't asking everybody to participate in our mission. That, as Chelsea said, all donors are important. All gifts are important. And these data show the American public, they realize the importance of a fundraising campaign that also includes many small gifts. So let's include everybody in our fundraising success. Uh, Dr. Chelsea Clark, a leader of, in our research team at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. The research is located on our website at philanthropy.iupui.edu. If you scroll across the top bar, you'll see the tab research. And if you also go a little bit over, you also see a tab uh, called News Media, and that's where press releases are sent out about our research projects as well. Uh, and these are free of charge on our website at philanthropy.iupui.edu. IUPUI.edu. Now, when you add a forward slash the fundraising school, or if you're at the research tab, just go over to the left, you'll find the fundraising school, and you'll locate our public courses, nearly two dozen that are informed by research such as this, translated to practical application for fundraising success. Because of this research, that's why our alumni meet or exceed their fundraising goals at a rate higher than the national average. We also have custom training. We can tailor make courses just for your nonprofit, your association, your region. We have quarterly webinars. We have these free podcasts. And of course, the new edition of Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, the signature textbook on the most effective fundraising techniques. Again, that website, philanthropy.iupui.edu. Our producers today are Mike Anthony and Dustin Donovan. I'm Bill Stajakiewicz, and now you are now more fully informed on this first day from the Fundraising School. Mm -hmm.